And the gospel reading today comes from Luke chapter 19, verses 41 through 44. As he came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, If you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up ramparts around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. They will crush you to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave, li leave within you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God. May God bless the hearing and understanding of his word. Three passages this morning that mention peace in a sense. Jesus, at the time when he's entering Jerusalem, at the time when he's about to be put to death, and he knows this, his disciples don't know it yet, but he knows what's going to happen. He says, if you had only recognized and known the things that make for peace, but you didn't recognize God in your midst. It's a tough word from Jesus. Then we have the passage from Romans, a passage near and dear to my heart because it was read at my ordination and I presented an American Sign Language. Even the burning coals heaped on somebody's head, that was an interesting thing to sign. But um, that is a passage near and dear to me, and it seems easy, doesn't it? To love what is genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another, outdo one another in showing honor. Sounds good, but then we get down to that awful thing about bless those who persecute you, bless do not curse them, and do not seek to repay evil for evil, to take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. And if it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Never avenge yourselves. Now, maybe you're not avenging yourselves. We like to get the last word, and don't we a little dig in sometimes? That seems to be commendable these days. But then we have that beautiful passage from Isaiah, one of my favorite in scripture, the peaceable kingdom. A shoot shall come out of the stump of Jesse. You know what that means, right? You know who Jesse was? He had a famous son. Who knows Jesse's son? Yell it out. King David. Very good. King David was Jesse's son. Did you ever cut down a tree in your yard and leave the stump behind only to have the branches grow up? If anybody goes up Sherwood Road and goes past my parents' house, you will see they had a beautiful Japanese cherry tree in their yard, and they were very disturbed when it was, um, I don't know if it was struck by lightning or what, but it started to die. They cut it down, but now it's just as big as it used to be, except everything grows out of the bottom of the, the branches upwards. That's a passage that always, always gives me goosebumps when I get to the part that says, a little child shall lead them. That section is what's called the peaceable kingdom, and there are paintings of the peaceable kingdom with the lion and the lamb and all, you know, feeding together. I've written a little different version of the peaceable kingdom. I want to read it for you now. The Aryan Brotherhood will celebrate Passover with the Jewish Anti-Defamation League. The NRA conventioners will plant flowers with members of Moms Against Guns. Tucker Carlson will take Rachel Maddow out for a beer, and a little child shall lead them. The Ku Klux Klan will embrace the NAACP. Their children shall play together. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Marjorie Taylor Greene will co-sponsor a bill. No kid in America will go to bed hungry. Our children will no longer need to participate in active shooter drills. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for America will be full of knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea, because a little child shall lead them, because Jesus Christ shall lead them. Tell me you laughed at some of those things, Tucker Carlson and Rachel Maddow, having a beer together. Or maybe not a beer, maybe just a glass of lemonade or iced tea. But why is that so funny? You can't see it happening, can you? Oh, Jesus said, if only you could know the things that make for peace in the world. We have to learn to believe in peace in our own nation. We have to learn to believe that peace is possible because with God, all things are possible. Nothing is impossible for God. But if we don't believe it, who else will believe it for us? I said that that line always gives me goosebumps. A little child shall lead them because I know who that little child is and who he'll grow to be. He'll grow to be the savior of the world, the one born in Bethlehem. But there's a movie that gives me that sort of same goosebump feeling. Now, back in 2020, when I was in my first year as pastor of Epworth, we had a film series 
for Lent that year, Pastor Terry's Cinema of Grace. That's what I call it every time I do a film series in a church. We had seen a couple of the films. We saw um, one on Mr. Rogers. We had 28 people here on a Sunday evening to watch a movie together and discuss it. But we didn't get to the last movie, which was called Places in the Heart. Have any of you ever seen Places in the Heart? 1984. Sally Field won Best Actress for that. It was nominated for Best Picture, did not win. But it's a movie that gives me goosebumps every time I see it or think about it. I saw it when I was in seminary. They showed it in one of our classes, and we were speechless at the end. It's a tough movie to watch in some ways because it happens during the Depression in the South, the Deep South. It starts on a Sunday with people in church. You hear them singing in a Protestant church, a little church out in the country somewhere, a little town. And then they go home, and the sheriff and his family are having dinner. His wife is Sally Field. They have two children. They're having dinner. Somebody comes by and says, so-and-so's down at the railroad track, and he's drunk. He's got a gun. The white sheriff goes, and there's a young black man with a gun. He's just drunk shooting at things, and he turns around and accidentally shoots the sheriff and kills him. Well, we go from there to the scene where they drag his body behind a car because they wanted his wife, the sheriff's wife to know that he, they took care of him. They lynched him. And then the story goes into her trying to hold on to the family farm without a husband to support her or her family. There's a black man played by Danny Glover. His name is Mose in the movie, and he stops by, and he tries to steal her silver, and the police bring him, and they're going to arrest him or probably lynch him too. And she says, no, 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 no. He's going to help me bring in my cotton crop. He reluctantly agrees, and he stays and helps her bring in the cotton crop. Meanwhile, the banker who wants her to foreclose on her mortgage brings back his brother-in-law, who is blind, played by John Malkovich, and he's kind of a nasty, bitter man. She has to put up with him as her boarder. But as the movie goes on, they bring in the cotton crop together, all these folks together. The Klan shows up to get rid of this black man who's living on her property. And the blind man says, I hear your voice, Mr. Jones. I recognize your voice, because he hasn't seen any faces ever, but he knows their voices. And Moses is driven out of town, and he leaves, and she brings the crop in. And you think the movie's over. And then we're back in that little church at the end of the film. And they're having communion. And you can tell it's a Protestant church because they're passing it along person to person to person to person to person. And what happens is that you see first the people in town passing it to each other. You see the men who are in the clan passing it to each other. And then you see them pass it to Mose the black man, and you think, wait, he left town, and then you think, wait, this is a church in the south in the Depression, there would not be a black man in church with white men. They pass it to him with the words, the peace of God, not the body of Christ, the peace of God as they pass it along. And then suddenly, it's passed to the woman who has played um, Sally Field's sister, whose husband has been unfaithful to her, and you don't know at the end if they're gonna save their marriage or not. And the wife passes it to her husband, the peace of God. And he passes it to Sally Field, and he says, the peace of God. She passes it to her dead husband, who's sitting in the church, saying, the peace of God. And he passes it to the man who shot him and took his life. And he says, the peace of God. And the movie ends. And everyone is stunned at that moment. Because it's something that didn't happen, should it? But it does because of Christ and who Christ is. We are called to live peaceably with one another. No matter what is done to us, not to let the world change us into the people we don't want to be, and that is hard. It's so hard to hold on to who you are in spite of what happens to you because we've all been treated poorly, haven't we? Raise your hand if no one has ever hurt you or abused you in some way. Nobody's got a hand up. And we're tempted, aren't we, to get in the last word? We're tempted to get in that dig, that name calling. We're tempted to go back and forth with each other, but no, in the name of Jesus Christ, we have to say no, we will not do that. We will stop it. We will look to the day when we can say to one another the peace of God and mean it. I believe this with all my heart. That it doesn't take the whole world to change. It's like the song says, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. That's what Paul writes to the Roman church. He says, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. It doesn't say, don't return evil for evil so that no evil is done for you, because he knows evil is done to us. Sometimes in the name of God, evil we do to each other in the church is scary to me. But in the nation especially where... Things are so divided right now, so divided. Believe it or not, I have friends who are political conservatives. Believe it or not, I really have friends who are very conservative politically. We talk and we discuss and we love each other despite of our differences, and that can happen in the world, but it takes intentionality 
It takes practice. It takes Christ in your life and in your heart to make it happen. But if just God's people and Jesus Christ would love each other and seek peace with one another, the world would change. We don't need everybody to come to Christ, which is why I say the idea of Christian nationalism sickens me. It really does, because Christian nationalism to me is antithetical, I do believe, because Constantine tried that with the Roman Empire. You remember Constantine, right? 300? His mother was converted to Christianity, which is why her son did. You know, that's how it started with Mama. Mama said, we're going to build a church here, 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 and here. His mother built churches so many places in the ancient world, especially in Jerusalem. Some of those churches were established by his mother. But he had a dream where he saw the cross on a shield and said, by this sign, conquer. And so he said, all right, we're all going to be Christians now. And that does not work when you say everybody's got to be a Christian because it's got to be an act of heart and will, not an act of coercion. You cannot be coerced into believing and really be a believer. So that's what it is with Christian nationalism. Don't be proud of being a Christian nationalist. I'm sorry if you are. Come talk to me. We've got to discuss this one at length because it's not about making everybody believe what we believe or do what we do or worship like we worship. It's about loving people as they are, as God has made them. And the world is the what makes people the way they are. Yesterday, I did a funeral in here for my cousin's son, who died at 34 years old of a massive heart attack with a 12-year-old son. I was sort of joking with some people about things that his friends got up and said in the lecture that shall never be repeated during worship here. Wow. I mean, his best friend stood up and said, he's a real blank, but he's our blank. I was sitting here trying to smile, going, wow, that's a little weird to hear in church. But I realized most of these folks had never been to church before. Most of them had not been to church before. Because no one ever invited them. No one thought it was important enough to tell them about Jesus Christ. No one had ever said to them, we want you to be part of our fellowship. And there were people there who had been excluded from polite society before. I understand they're not exactly polite, but they're welcome here. We've got to be at peace, folks, because if we don't set the example for the world, who will? Jesus, when he is getting ready to face his own death, looked and said, if only you had realized the things that make for peace. If only you'd realized God's presence with you, the world would have changed already. But this is a Sunday of joy, and we're going to rejoice, aren't we? We're going to rejoice in the fact that Christ will come again, and Christ is going to judge. He's going to judge for the poor and the oppressed of the world, He's going to judge not by what he sees or what he hears, but by his heart that loves all people, loves all of us. As broken as we are, as miserably sinful as we can be, Christ loves us and gave himself to redeem us. That is cause to celebrate. So if you think I'm too political sometimes, that's okay. It's okay, it really is. Because when I talk about race and things like that, I'm not talking political, I'm talking about sin. It's a sin to like dislike anyone because of the color of his or her skin or their background or what they were taught growing up. That's where the sin is. We've got to dig out the sin and love this, each other. You can love people who are different than you, can't you? Can you? Can we love people who disagree with us? We can indeed. Can we love people who vote the opposite way than we vote? Yes, we can. Can we love people no matter what their color is or what their background is? Yes, we can. We just have to let it begin with us, and it will spread through all the world. Like I said, we started singing Let There Be Peace on Earth when I was a little kid in school. It's a song that moved all of us because the world was at war at the time. Our nation was at war. Older brothers and sisters of people in my elementary school class were at war at that time, and we sang Let There Be Peace on Earth, and we meant it. But it's got to begin with us. It's got to begin inside of each of our hearts, and then it spreads to our families, and then it spreads to our communities, it spreads throughout the congregation and into the world. Because the message of the angel still rings true, doesn't it? Glory to God in highest heaven on earth, peace, on earth, peace, on earth, peace, shalom, wholeness, fulfillment, everyone having what they need. So let's work for the day when the Brotherhood will celebrate Passover with the Jewish Anti-Defamation League. The NRA conventioners will plant flowers with the mothers against guns. Tucker Carlson will take Rachel Maddow out one of these days because Christ will come again and set us on the right path. Amen?
Amen.